I'm a family doctor whose primary focus is uh, addiction medicine. And so I work in Penticton at a clinic called the Martin Street Outreach Centre. And then I also work for Interior Health. My plan for the evening is just to give you a bit of background in terms of the history of addiction. And then um, we'll look at some of the ongoing research efforts that are currently underway to better understand addiction and how it can be treated. After that, we'll talk a bit about how we define addiction, and then we'll review some of the brain pathways that are involved in um, the reward pathways in the brain, so the, the pathways that are involved in addiction. And then we'll also look at how on neuroimaging or brain imaging, we can see changes that occur with chronic alcohol or drug use. After this, we'll go through a couple of cases, and I kind of use the term cases uh, lightly. They're more just kind of short snapshots of individual patients, one with alcohol and one with opiates, just as a segue so that we can talk about the treatment options available for both alcohol addiction and opiate addiction. And I chose these two topics because I was having a really tough time kind of trying to summarize addiction medicine in one hour, and I thought I would just pick two substances. Um, so that's not to say that there aren't a, a bunch of other substances that are highly addictive that we have uh, good treatments for. So nicotine um, is one of them that I, I don't really touch on. Um, also stimulants, so things like cocaine and amphetamines, I don't really touch on, but I'm happy to, to field some questions at the end of the talk. And then right at the end, we'll just talk about why some of the treatments that we have are underutilized and some opportunities to change that. So essentially across the span of human history, there's been documentation that humans have desire to take mood altering substances. And since the beginning of the 20th century, people who were addicted were thought to be either morally flawed or lacking in willpower. Medically, we thought that maybe these people had bad blood. And really these views have shaped uh, society's response to drug abuse and addiction. And so we've been largely treating it as a moral fail failure or a moral failing as opposed to a health problem. So this is a journal article that was written um, back in 1919, published in the American Journal of Public Health. And it was written by a physician named Dr. Ernest Bishop. And he wrote about addiction as a disease that required treatment instead of criminalization. And he called for a revolution to wake up physicians and the general public to be educated to see addiction as an illness and treat it as such. Unfortunately, almost 100 years later, we're still having very similar conversations about how to treat addiction. So where are we at today in terms of understanding uh, addiction? So over the past several decades, there's been enormous research invested in addiction medicine. So the National Institute on Drug Abuse, or NIDA, is an American organization that invests over $1.5 billion annually to uh, better understand the neuroscience that underpins addiction and how we should treat it. In Canada, we have the Canadian Center uh, on Substance Abuse that invests $7 million annually on substance use epidemiology and research. In addition to these large uh, bodies, we also have a number of uh, federal research grants that fund addiction medicine research. So there's lots of money going into research. And addiction medicine is really an active area of academic research. So there's regularly publications related to addiction in some of the most highly reputable medical journals in the world. So including JAMA, which is the Journal of American of the American Medical Association, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, and the BMJ or British Medical Journal. In addition to this, there's a large number of peer-reviewed journals whose primary focus is on publishing research on addiction and its treatment. So unfortunately, despite this huge evidence body to support treating addiction as a medical condition uh, using science-based treatments, we continue to uh, frame addiction as being a choice and see it as a weakness. Um, so there's really a large disconnect between what we know scientifically about addiction and its application in practice. As many of you are well aware, we continue to treat addiction as a criminal issue rather than a medical one. 
And what we've learned from this is it's really not effective in decreasing uh, drug use, decreasing crime related to trafficking, but it is incredibly costly to treat it this way. Um, and increasingly, there is some political recognition that addiction is a medical disease that requires treatment, not criminalization. And treating it criminally really is ineffective in, in terms of improving outcomes. So this is a bit long, but I'm just going to go through it anyways, and then we're going to go through the kind of key elements at the end. So there's many different ways to define addiction. Um, this is one that I particularly like from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, which defines addiction um, as a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. And it's dysfunction in these circuits that leads to characteristic biological, psychological, social, and spiritual manifestations. And this is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing and or obtaining relief by substance use and other behaviors. Additionally, it's characterized by an inability to consistently abstain, uh, impairment in behavioral control, craving, diminish recognition of significant problems with one's behaviors and interpersonal relationships, and a dysfunctional emotional response. And like other chronic diseases, addiction often involves cycles of relapse and remission. And without treatment or engagement in recovery activities, addiction is progressive and can result in disability or premature death. So here's the really key elements out of that definition. So it's a chronic disease of the brain. It involves brain pathways that are involved in reward, motivation, and memory. It has manifestations in many different realms, um, so biological, but also social, uh, spiritual, and psychological. And part of the disease involves cycles of relapse and remission, and this is not unlike other chronic diseases. And without treatment, it can result in disability and premature death. In practical terms, um, when I have a patient sitting in front of me, I think of the five C's of addiction, or when I'm teaching medical students or residents about addiction, these are really the, the things that we look for. So the first is a lack of control. And so a, a kind of classic example of this is someone with an alcohol addiction who may say like, oh, I'm just gonna have one glass of wine. And then when they have that first sip or two of wine, it means they're drinking the whole bottle or two bottles or a 26 or So they don't have control once they start. Um, secondly, a compulsion to use. And then really in my mind, the crux of addiction is having negative consequences from your use. So those consequences can be negative uh, medical consequences. So, so in someone who smokes cigarettes, they may have COPD or they may have lung cancer and they use despite having, having that consequence. In someone, um, uh, other examples of negative consequences may be relationship consequences. It could be occupational consequences, so alcohol use interfering with your ability to go to work or showing up for work hungover. Um, there used to be in the old DSM a criteria for legal consequences, but that's actually recently been removed in the newest uh, DSM. And the DSM is the Diagnostics uh, Statistical Manual, which is kind of like the, the Bible for psychiatrists in terms of making psychiatric diagnoses. Um, so having these consequences and then continued use despite the above. And then the last one is craving. So that's a strong desire or preoccupation to use. So those are really the things that when we're, we're looking at uh, a patient in front of us, that's how we diagnose it clinically. And then we also go through the criteria in the DSM, but I won't, I won't go through all of those. So who's at risk of addiction? So like other chronic diseases, uh, there's certain risk factors that place individuals at higher risk of developing disease. So in terms of biological risk factors, we know that a very large aspect is related to genetic predisposition. It's probably up to 50% of addiction risk is related to our genes. Additionally, there's environmental factors. And in particular, there's lots of interesting research looking at our, what are called adverse childhood experiences. And essentially, the larger the number of these adverse childhood experiences that you have, it places you at an increased risk of going on to develop an addiction. 
And these types of experiences include things like witnessing domestic violence, various types of abuse, so physical, sexual, emotional, um, as well as types of neglect, parental separation, incarceration of a loved one, um, or substance misuse within the household. And again, essentially, the, the greater number of those types of exposures you have, the higher risk you are to develop an addiction. And that's specifically um, in childhood. Additionally, one's peer group and their attitudes towards use can put you at a higher risk. Also, the availability of the drug. Um, and then there's also characteristics within the drug itself, including how rapidly it reaches the brain that makes certain substances um, more addictive. So um, intravenous routes or smoked drugs are uh, put you at a higher risk of de developing dependence compared to drugs taken orally. This is a view of the brain. Essentially, if I cut my brain in half and opened it up, that's what we're looking at. And so to the left of your screen is the front of the brain, and to the uh, right of the screen is the back of the brain. And then I'm going to kind of go over a couple of really important structures that are involved in what are called the reward pathways in our brain. Um, so the first area is an area called the ventral tegmental area. And this area produces something called dopamine. What dopamine is, is a neurotransmitter, which is essentially a chemical messenger that communicates between nerve cells. So the ventral tegmental area produces dopamine. And what the ventral tegmental area, or the VTA, does is it sends information via nerve cells or neurons to an area called the nucleus accumbens. When the nucleus accumbens receives these dopamine messages, it experiences pleasure. It's also involved in kind of recalling what that activity was that was pleasurable. And the purpose of this is, and sorry, the other kind of key things that it, it does are, are that it's involved in motivation and, and goal-directed behavior. So essentially, every time that, that system or that pathway is activated, your brain's like, oh, that felt good. How do I repeat this? And it, it stores information about what that activity was. Additionally, the, the VTA, so that first part of the brain right in the middle of the screen that I showed you also sends messages to an area of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. And this part of the brain is involved in impulse control. And we know in addiction that part of the brain is impaired. Uh, additionally, there's a couple other parts of the brain called the amygdala and hippocampus, and these store information about memory and environmental cues. And these memories help create what's called a conditioned response or a craving any time a person encounters these environmental cues again. And so an example of that is someone who has a cocaine addiction. If we looked at their brain and put them in like neuroimaging testing and we showed them pictures of scenes of nature, pictures of puppies, and then we showed a picture of a crack pipe, their brain, as soon as they see that drug paraphernalia, will start lighting up in anticipation of the drug coming. So why do we have these reward centers in our brain? Our brains are essentially hardwired to ensure that we will repeat activities that are important for our survival. So things like eating food, nurturing our children, and having sex are all really important activities that need to be repeated for us to survive as a species. And thus our brains have adapted to associate these types of activities with pleasure or reward. Whenever these brain uh, pathways are activated, the brain again notes that something important is happening, it feels good, it feels pleasurable, and that activity needs to be remembered. Uh, and then our, our brain essentially forms memories to teach us to do that activity again and again without much thought. What happens with drugs of abuse, so drugs like cocaine, amphetamines, heroin, nicotine, they all stimulate the exact same circuitry in the brain and result in release of dopamine um, in the same reward pathways in our brain. What's different about drugs of abuse compared to natural rewards is the amount of dopamine that's released. So with drugs of abuse, depending on the route and depending on the drug, it results in between two to 10 times the amount of dopamine being released when compared to natural rewards. And in some cases, this depends on the route as well. So again, if a, if a drug is smoked or injected, 
it results in a, in a quicker peak or a, a bigger surge in dopamine. Uh, because of the drug's effect on the reward systems in our brain, um, because it's so strong and powerful with, with these drugs, so it's 10 times greater than it would be in terms of the reward we would get from eating food, people often start to change their behavior to use these drugs again and again. And what we see is that they start reprioritizing their lives essentially to use that drug again and again, over things that they would have previously found pleasurable. So over things like getting satisfaction out of their job or hugging their kids or eating food. And so that explains some of the behaviors that we see in, in people uh, who are struggling with addiction. So just to quickly review, natural rewards are things that are important for survival. So eating food is a good example. Um, and it results in increases in dopamine and the reward pathways in our brain. Drugs of abuse use the exact same system, but result in much larger amounts of dopamine. Um, each drug uses a slightly different mechanism in, in terms of how it releases that dopamine. So in this picture, um, those bigger kind of red molecules on the right side of your screen are cocaine. And what they do is they actually block the reabsorption of dopamine in the area between the two cells, which is called the synaptic cleft. So that's how it increases dopamine. Uh, amphetamines, for example, um, they actually result in an increased amount of dopamine being released from the, the cell on the top towards the cell on the bottom. What we know from um, looking at imaging of long-term drug or alcohol use is that it changes our brain chemistry. So as an individual continues to use drugs, the brain adjusts to these overwhelming kind of surges or spikes in dopamine. And what it does is it tries to kind of settle things down. So it decreases the amount of dopamine produced overall, and it also downregulates or decreases the number of dopamine receptors. This is kind of similar to turning down the volume on a, on a speaker that's too loud. So as a result of these brain changes, uh, dopamine has less impact on the, on the brain's reward system. And as an individual continues to use, they develop what's called tolerance. And so what that means is they typically need to use more of a drug to get the same effect. So this image is just a, a picture of a healthy control and then an individual who uses drugs, in this case methamphetamines. And we see that the, the concentration or the level of dopamine receptors is significantly decreased in the individual who uses drugs. This diagram shows a fairly typical course of someone during their addiction. So initially we see that an individual uses drugs or alcohol to feel euphoria, to feel happiness, and their reward uh, pathways in their brain are really active. They're telling them to pay attention to that stimuli, repeat it, it feels good. With repeated use, we see that those receptors in their brain adapt, so they downregulate the amo amount of dopamine that's produced and downregulate the receptors. And what ends up happening is they feel kind of dysphoric, they may feel anxious, and then they're actually driven to use their drug more so to feel normal. So you see they're kind of in that red zone and they just keep using to feel normal. And this is why we see that some people with addiction will say that they actually hate their drug of choice. They really don't want to use, they get no pleasure out of it, but they're compelled to continue to use. So really what they're doing is just trying to get themselves out of withdrawal and kind of get in that normal level. Our goal with certain types of addiction is sometimes to help with medication therapies to get people back in that normal level. So in particular with opiate addiction, which I'm gonna spend a bit of time talking about, our goal is to get people to feel normal without the peaks and troughs of the euphoria and withdrawal. We just want them kind of in that blue zone right in the middle of the screen there. The brain changes that we see with addiction are really very similar to organ changes we see with other chronic diseases. Uh, for example, we see on imaging organ dysfunction and heart disease. We see pancreatic dysfunction uh, with diabetes. And this is, this is very similar to other chronic diseases that we see. So in, in addiction, we see brain changes. Like other chronic diseases like asthma, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, it's common that people have relapses or periods um, in their disease where things aren't very well controlled. And really a relapse should trigger intensifying the treatment and supporting the person further. And unfortunately with addiction, th that's not often the way that we treat it. 
Um, the really exciting thing is that while we know that these brain changes occur with long-term drug use, we also know that they're reversible. To a large degree, with prolonged abstinence, these brain changes can result in kind of renormalization of the dopamine receptors. And the encouraging news is that the longer an individual remains abstinent, the more likely they are to have long-term sustained recovery. Just to quickly review kind of what we've covered so far, um, addiction is a chronic brain disease that affects the reward pathways in our brain. Drugs of abuse cause spikes or surges in dopamine that are much greater than what we would receive from natural rewards like eating food. With repeated use, this causes dopamine levels to decrease overall and the number of receptors to be downregulated. And these changes explain why we see tolerance, so people using more drug to get the same effect. And it can also result in people using drugs or alcohol just to kind of feel normal. Uh, addiction is treatable, and the brain changes we see are reversible, but they do take time. And addiction is not unlike many other chronic diseases, and it really should be treated um, as a chronic disease, not just acute treatment, so not like a 30-day stint at a, at a treatment center. So we'll go on to the cases now, and again, like I said at the beginning, we're going to do one case on alcohol, one case on opiates, and really the purpose of the case is just to kind of have a conversation about the treatment options that we have. When we think of addiction, we often think of hard drugs, so we think of heroin, cocaine, crystal meth, but really the overall harms and costs related to addiction and substance use are mainly the legal drugs. So tobacco and alcohol cause the bulk of the, of the cost to our healthcare system. So this is data from the Canadian Centre on Substance Abuse, which looked at the impact of uh, different substances in terms of death, illness, economic costs, including uh, data from healthcare and law enforcement, as well as loss of productivity in the workplace um, and at home. And what you can see is the majority of the costs are related to, to tobacco and alcohol. So on to alcohol. This is a bit of a busy slide, so I apologize, but we'll go through it quickly. As uh, most of you are aware, alcohol use is super common, both globally and within Canada. About 25% of Canadians uh, who drink had an episode of what's called heavy drinking in the past 30 days. So that's drinking four or more drinks um, on one occasion. And about just under 5% of Canadians met the criteria for an alcohol use disorder or alcohol addiction. And the potential harms related to heavy drinking are numerous and include uh, negative me medical consequences, including liver disease, uh, so cirrhosis of the liver, but also uh, liver impairment, as well as uh, various cancers, injuries from falls, motor vehicle accidents, violence, also social and economic consequences, including relationship problems, absenteeism from school and work, among others. So onto our case. So this is a case that was uh, featured in a CBC documentary called Wasted, and there's an autobiography available of the same name. And so the documentary features a man named Mike Pond, who was actually a psychologist who worked in Penticton. And Mike struggled with alcohol addiction, and um, he was repeatedly told to attend AA. And felt a lot of shame because it really didn't work for him, but that seemed to be the, the answer that he kept getting was go to AA, go to AA. And eventually Mike ended up in the downtown east side area of Vancouver. He was homeless for a period of time and eventually got treatment using a couple of the medications that I'm going to talk about and is now doing very well. He's in long-term recovery and um, is involved in public speaking, talking about the compassionate treatment of people with with addiction and also um, increasing use of, of evidence-based or science-based treatments to, to treat addiction. Um, and I again thought this case would just be a nice segue to talk about what the options are for alcohol addiction. For those of you who don't know, AA or Alcoholics Anonymous is a group that was started in the 1930s um, by two people. So one was a gentleman named Bill Wilson and the other was a physician named Bob Smith. And Bill Wilson attained sobriety uh, largely through um, affiliation with a Christian movement. And then Bob Smith, uh, 
was kind of inspired by the changes that Bill had done and they got together and they wrote a book. And so this book kind of spelled out their philosophy and principles in what's now known as the, the 12 steps. And so in AAA, members meet in groups, they help one another achieve and maintain abstinence, the meetings are free, they're open to anyone serious about stopping their alcohol use, and participants are encouraged to kind of work through these 12 steps. Opinions of AA are, are really mixed, so I'm just going to present a couple of kind of headlines and then we'll go through what the research is for it. Um, so you'll see some articles touting it as being incredibly successful in helping alcoholics. And then you'll see an equally large number of articles in the media that say maybe it doesn't work at all. So what the academic literature shows is that it probably works really well for some people. So probably about 30, maybe 40% of people, um, but doesn't work for everyone. The people that it seems to work for are people that regularly attend AA meetings. They fully participate, so they kind of, in the studies, they make this distinction between attendance and really participating, and also the individuals who provide service back to the AA community. I felt conflicted presenting this because there's two million members in AA worldwide today and there's no doubt that AA has saved hundreds of thousands of lives if not millions of lives and so this isn't meant to, to say that they're not doing great work. All it's meant to say is that there are other options and AA doesn't work for everyone but it, I, I would say it has saved millions of lives. Um, for the people it doesn't work for, Coerced AA um, doesn't seem to, to work that well. And then some people, it just doesn't work. Bill Wilson, the founder of AA, kind of recognized that it's just one tool available for the treatment of alcohol addiction. So what are other tools? Um, so there's good evidence that there's a number of therapies that work, including cognitive behavioral therapy, which is kind of therapy looking at what our inner tapes are or what our inner thoughts are and how, how to change those. They also work at kind of skill building around what situations are potentially triggering. There's also motivational enhancement therapy, which is designed to boost motivation um, to cease problem drinking, and that can also be effective. Additionally, there's several Health Canada approved medications for the treatment of alcohol addiction that are really, really underutilized. So the two big ones that I'm gonna talk about, one's called naltrexone. Naltrexone. And naltrexone is an opiate receptor uh, blocker um, that is indicated for the treatment of alcohol addiction and works really well. It, it seems to work particularly well for people who drink uh, kind of for that euphoria or like getting drunk. Naltrexone is a once daily medication. Acamprosate is a medication that you take three times a day. And really both of these medications have really, really good research showing that when people are on these medications, they're much more likely to be abstinent. And if they do drink, they're much more likely to have um, fewer drinks. And so we, we, in alcohol studies, we look at something called heavy drinking days, and that's anything more than four standard drinks in a day. And when people are on these medications, they often drink much less. And what we know is if we have an alcoholic who's drinking a 26 ounce bottle of hard alcohol a day, and we can get them down, even if they're still drinking, and they're drinking three or four ounces of alcohol today, in terms of the harms, it's great. In some people, the goal may not always be complete abstinence, and we may put people on this med medication and they may drink way less, and in terms of medical harms, that's a, probably a pretty good outcome. Um, of all people with alcohol addiction, only about a third of people actually receive treatment for their addiction, and only a very small percentage, so less than 10%, receive medications to assist in reducing their consumption. So they're really underutilized medications. Increasingly, there's research looking at alternative medication options for alcohol addiction. So there's a medication called gabapentin. This is a medication that's commonly used for neuropathic pain or nerve pain. And there's, there's increasing research uh, looking at this medication for the treatment of alcohol addiction. This study showed really a nice dose response effect that when people are on this medication, they're 
more likely to have abstinence. And again, if, they're, if they are drinking, they're less likely to have heavy drinking days while they're on this medication. Um, earlier, I mentioned an oral pill called naltrexone, which is available in Canada for the treatment of alcohol addiction. In the US, they have this medication called Vivitrol, which is an extended release um, injectable form of this of, of naltrexone. Um, so it's an injection that you would get once a month. Um, it's not yet available in Canada, but maybe a treatment option in the coming years. So just to review, in terms of the treatment options that we have, there's a number of different options. So 12 steps works well for some people, psychotherapy works well for some people, and medications work well for some people. And often we have to do a combination of these therapies. So if one thing isn't working, we should try something else or we should try combinations of things. And really this is how we treat any other disease in medicine. So if I have an individual in my clinic who has a new diagnosis of diabetes, we might talk about for the first couple of months having them do lifestyle changes, so diet and exercise changes, and then I'll have them come back to my office, we'll chat about how it's going, and if it's not going well, then we'll intensify the treatment. So I may refer them to a diabetes nurse educator, or I may send them to a dietitian, or we may start a medication. And again, we'll have a period to see how it goes, and then I'll reassess them, and we may need to increase the dose or send them to an endocrinologist or do something else, but we're continuing to, to try new things and to intensify the treatment if it's not working. And really, that's what we should be doing with addiction, is not just saying, keep trying this, keep trying this. If it's not working, we, we need to, to change our treatment options. So let's shift gears a little bit, and then we'll, we'll chat about opiates. I was practicing for my husband, and he was like, what are opiates? <laughs> so I added in this slide. So opiates uh, are substances that bind to the opiate receptor and produce morphine-like effects. So they're used primarily for pain relieving aspects, um, but occasionally they're used for other things. So uh, for example, sometimes a codeine cough syrup is, is prescribed because it suppresses um, cough. The common side effects of all opiate medications are itchiness, sedation, nausea, constipation, euphoria, and respiratory depression. I've highlighted or underlined there respiratory depression um, because this is what people die of overdoses from. When you hear of opiate overdoses, it's respiratory depression that is the cause of death. So essentially what happens is if you take too much or you don't have tolerance, your breathing rate slows, and this is an aspect of all opiates, and if you, if you take too much, your breathing rate slows to a level where your, your brain doesn't receive enough oxygen and you, and you die. Um, so that's, that can happen with taking too much of an opiate. It can also happen if we combine opiates with other depressant medications um, or alcohol. So for example, opiates in combination with medications called benzodiazepines. So those are medications like Ativan or Valium or Clonazepam or Xanax is a really dangerous combination um, because they're both depressants and they can actually act synergistically and increase risk of, of overdose. Examples of opiates are heroin, opium, morphine, codeine, oxycodone, fentanyl, methadone. There's lots of different ones. And what's confusing in medicine is everything has a a generic name, but it also has a brand name. So um, there are some brand names that are also in there. So Percocet, Oxycodone, or Oxycontin, Oxyneo, those are the brand names. Tylenol 3, and those are all opiate medications. As most of you are probably very aware, across the uh, province and really across the country, um, individuals are dying from overdoses from a drug called fentanyl. Uh, so fentanyl is a very strong opiate medication that's usually reserved for treatment of severe, often cancer-related pain. And it's between 50 to 100 times more powerful than morphine. And what that means is even a very, very, very small amount of this medication can be lethal. This graph shows opiate overdoses in BC from 1990 until 
2016. And as you can see, opiate overdoses are increasing at an incredibly alarming rate in the province. So from January to September of this year, there have been 555 overdoses in the province thus far, compared with 355 in the same time period last year. And you can see that even last year was up from previous years. Uh, this is American data showing that over the past 15 years um, in the U.S. there has been a steady increase in the number of deaths from U.S. prescription opiates as well as a six-fold increase in the past 15 years or so in the number of uh, deaths from heroin overdoses. And in the U.S. people are now more likely to die of a drug overdose than they are of a motor vehicle accident and the majority of these drug overdoses are related to uh, prescription opiates and to heroin. And it's the same situation in BC. So why are we seeing this big rise in overdoses? There's a number of reasons, and I've kind of boiled it down to two, but there's many more. The biggest reason is probably the overprescription of opiate medications by doctors. Um, so Canada is second only to the US in terms of highest rates of opiate prescribing, and we're about five times more than the UK. And there's nothing to make me think that Canadians have way more pain than people in the UK. Um, so opiates are being prescribed probably too frequently at really high doses um, and in large quantities and often for longer periods of time than medically necessary, as well as for conditions that really aren't supported by evidence in terms of their uh, using opiates for that condition. And we know that some of these individuals that are prescribed opiates will then go on to develop addiction, but there's also likely um, diversion of some of these opiates. So whether it's kids experimenting and they, they take opiates from a, a medicine cabinet at home, or some people who are prescribed more than they really need and then recognize that there's, if they sold them, they can actually make a lot of money. Um, so there is diversion um, into kind of the illicit drug scene. The second reason um, why we're seeing this massive rise in overdoses is really around impurity of drugs. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but um, fentanyl is increasingly being mixed in things that aren't even being sold as opiates. So we're, we've heard of overdoses occurring, people are purchasing cocaine that they intend to use recreationally, but it has fentanyl in it, and they have no tolerance to opiates at all, and they're high, high risk of dying of overdoses. So over the past two years, we've seen these dramatic rises in the number of prescriptions for opiate medications, both in Canada and the US. There's a number of reasons why this has occurred, um, but a, a, a big portion of it is actually some really crafty marketing from the makers of this medication called OxyContin. So the, the makers of the medication, OxyContin is a, a time-released or long-acting version of the opiate called Oxycodone. And when it came on the market in the mid-1990s, Purdue Pharma, who produces this medication, really marketed it towards physicians, telling them that there's minimal risk of, of addiction, which was one of the reasons why physicians weren't, weren't keen on prescribing opiates previously. And so they, they told physicians, oh, you're under-treating pain, there's really low addiction risk, um, and really physicians should probably be more liberal in prescribing, even if it meant prescribing strong opiates. Physicians were taught pain is the fifth vital sign, like we need to really aggressively treat it. And their campaign worked. According to this article in the American Journal of Public Health, um, prescriptions for OxyContin for non-cancer related pain went from 670,000 in 1997 up to 6.2 million prescriptions in 2002, uh, just five years later. And what we later learned was OxyContin can be highly addictive. Um, so in 2007, Purdue pleaded guilty to misbranding the drug's abuse potential and paid over $600 million in fines. And what we see is as prescription sales increased, 
This was mirrored by opiate-related deaths as well as treatments, uh, sorry, admission to treatment facilities uh, for opiates specifically. This is kind of going back to my second point there about overdoses and impurity of drugs. The fentanyl that you hear about in the media right now, about it being mixed in heroin and cocaine and crystal meth, it's mainly um, fentanyl that's being produced actually in Asia, mainly China, and being um, trafficked in Canada and being mixed in these, these drugs in the illicit drug scene. It's not generally fentanyl patches that are prescribed by, by physicians. Fentanyl by weight is incredibly powerful, so even a very small volume, like a kilogram of fentanyl, could produce millions of these fentanyl pills that you, you probably have heard about in the media right now. So it actually makes it an easier drug to traffic, which makes it really tough to control. This is a fictional case, but is somewhat realistic of a lot of patients that I see with opiate addiction. So Sarah is a 28-year-old female. Just to give you a bit of background about her, she has a family history of alcohol addiction in both of her parents. So again, she has that genetic kind of risk already there. She has a history of anxiety, and she was prescribed a medication called Ativan, which is an anxiolytic medication. And she had some difficulty controlling her use, so she would she'd use it a bit more than she was actually supposed to. She'd run out early a couple of times. And then um, she was in a car accident. It wasn't that serious of a car accident, just kind of rear-ended, had some neck pain, was prescribed Tylenol-3, didn't find it effective. Her family doctor switched her to Percocet, tried that for a little bit. Worked initially, but then her pain didn't really seem to kind of settle down as expected within a month. Um, so over the course of a year, her dose was slowly increased to try and get her neck pain under control. And then a friend was like, well, like if you chew your Percocet, it actually might get your pain under control quicker. So she started chewing her Percocet um, and found that it worked for pain relief. She also liked the euphoria that she got with it. And then she started snorting her pills. Her family doctor was like, I'm not being a part of this anymore, and stopped prescribing for her. Um, what that meant is that she went through withdrawal, and then she was having strong cravings to use, so she started buying opiates on the street, um, used them intermittently, snorting them, chewing them, and then tried injecting them. So she injected for a period of time, really expensive to buy prescription opiates on the street, Heroin's a much cheaper option, so switch to, to heroin, and that's something that I quite commonly see. Um, and then presented to her family doctor who suggested she go to detox to get off her opiates. So she goes to detox. Her urine drug screen at detox is positive both for heroin and fentanyl, um, which are two separate tests on a urine drug screen and she didn't intentionally ever use fentanyl, and this is what we're seeing clinically all the time. Um, so a lot of my patients have no intentional use of, of uh, fentanyl, and when we check their urine drug screens, they're often positive. So it's, it's mixed in to the drugs seen right now to a huge degree. Um, so she goes to detox, seven days is off all her opiates, and then she's released and then she relapses within about five days of discharge. Detox is the process of withdrawing an individual from drugs or alcohol. In the case of alcohol, it often needs to be medically managed because there's potential for seizures and alcohol withdrawal, same with benzodiazepine withdrawal. Detox can happen at home, uh, sometimes with a lot of support, but it's commonly done at kind of specialized centers called detox facilities or detox centers. Um, another distinction between detox is it's not treatment. So detox is really just getting the person off the drug. It's not residential treatment at all, and often that gets confused. So what residential treatment is, is it's a inpatient kind of intensive treatment, generally between a month to three months, sometimes longer. And it involves a combination of one-on-one you know, -on -one counseling, often group counseling, uh, medical treatment, in kind of a holistic lens, or in my mind it should be in a holistic lens. Is detox a good treatment for opiate addiction? This report from the World Health Organization and the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime showed that the period right after either release from prison 
person or right after detox actually puts the individual at a significantly increased risk of fatal overdose. Um, so it's important to note that detox can potentially be a really important um, kind of first contact or a bridge to other treatment options, but for opiate addiction as a kind of standalone or isolated intervention, it's actually potentially harmful. So uh, abruptly stopping opiates and tapering the person off um, puts them at really high risk of relapse if you only do that. So the relapse rates are upwards of 90% and most of them are within a week. So most individuals while they're in detox, so that week while they're there, they, you take away all of their tolerance to the opiates and then the relapse rates are 90%. So statistically speaking, if they do relapse, they're high risk of overdose and dying of that overdose because they've lost their tolerance. Additionally, there's been studies that um, have looked at in people who inject opiates, um, when we compare detox compared to doing nothing at all, detoxing them alone actually puts them at higher risk of acquiring HIV or Hep C infection, and that's likely because of high risk behavior, high risk injecting behaviors um, in that period after detox. So what about residential treatment? And the caveat is this is, it's residential treatment but without medication-assisted treatment or opiate agonist treatment, so treatment without methadone or suboxone. Um, there's ongoing research looking at this. It's not that promising. So again, upwards of 90% of people will relapse, 60% um, probably within the first week of discharge um, if we look at just residential treatment alone. So it doesn't seem to be a, a great uh, treatment option. So what does work? Really the mainstay of treatment for opiate addiction is what's called opiate agonist therapy. It has a bunch of different names. So there's opiate agonist therapy, opiate substitution therapy, opiate replacement therapy, medication assisted therapy. All of those things really mean the same thing. It's treatment with a medication called methadone or a medication called buprenorphine naloxone or suboxone is the, the name that most people know. These medications are both medications that bind to the opiate receptor and are really long acting. So you take them once a day. They don't peak like opiates when they're abused do. So they're really, the goal is just to get steady state blood levels. So a really smooth line. So people don't get euphoria when they take methadone or suboxone. And the goal of the treatment is to alleviate opiate withdrawal, help with cravings, such that when we dose these medications appropriately, people shouldn't have cravings at all and they really don't use opiates. The other thing is when we dose them appropriately, their opiate receptors are essentially saturated with this medication so that if they use opiates on top, they don't get euphoria from it or they don't get high. Um, so methadone is generally a liquid. It does uh, come in a pill form, but that's usually when we're using it for the treatment of pain exclusively, not pain and addiction. And it's a liquid that's given once a day. It's generally uh, given as what's called a, a witnessed ingestion, which means that the individual goes to the pharmacy and the pharmacy, or the pharmacist rather, watches them take the medication at the pharmacy every day. Um, with buprenorphine uh, naloxone or suboxone, it's a tablet that's dissolved under the tongue once a day. And um, the treatment duration for both these medications is long. So it's generally suggested at least a year and then a slow taper off the medication. And the reason for this is when we do short treatments like a week taper or a two week taper, the relapse rates are again really, really high. So a longer course of treatment, treating it as a chronic disease seems to work much better. So it is a long term treatment. A number of really high quality studies have shown that when we compare treatment with methadone to no opiate replacement, um, individuals on methadone are much more likely to stay in treatment and they're much less likely to use opiates, uh, including heroin. There's also really interest, I think it's really interesting research, um, looking at uh, treatment of methadone that shows that it decreases HIV risk behaviors and also decreases crime. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. So if we, we know that a lot of people when they're in their addiction, 
will do what they have to t do to get the money they need to buy the drugs that, that they feel like they need. Some of my patients, their, their drug use costs them $500 a day. And so unless you make a lot of money, it's pretty tough to, su to support that. So lots of people do sex work, they may, do, they may deal drugs, or they may um, do other things to kind of make that extra money. When you treat their addiction, they're not using opiates, they're not doing those things. So we see that actually when people are on methadone, their rates of crimes go down. And these findings have been replicated in many other settings. Additionally, there's lots of research showing that when people are connected on methadone maintenance therapy, it can improve other aspects of their overall health care, including adherence to antiretroviral medications for HIV. And from a public health standpoint, this is really exciting. So what we know is in people with HIV, if they adhere to their medication, we can get what's called their viral load or um, how much virus is in their bloodstream to a level that's undetectable, so, so very low. And what happens is when their viral load is undetectable, the risk of them transmitting the HIV virus to other people is essentially nothing. Um, so this is a really exciting outcome. So what about Suboxone? Um, so it's been around about 15 years in the US and coming up on 10 years in Canada. And we have new provincial opiate addiction guidelines that are coming out. They were supposed to be out in November, then I heard December, now I'm hearing January. They're on the way. And they're, these guidelines are advocating for the use of Suboxone first line over methadone. And so we'll talk a little bit about, about why that is. What Suboxone is, is it, it's kind of a, a neat drug. It's a partial opiate agonist. So it sits on the opiate uh, receptor, but it only stimulates it part way. And it also kind of blocks that receptor. So when the Suboxone molecule is on that receptor, if you use heroin or other opiates on top, they can't bind. And so people don't get euphoria from, from whatever drug it is they're using. Suboxone's kind of special because it has this kind of sealing effect in terms of respiratory depression. So what we see with full opiate agonists, so methadone, morphine, heroin, oxycodone, is as the dose goes up, their breathing rate goes down. So that's why people die of an overdose. What happens with Suboxone is it kind of has this plateau in terms of respiratory depression. So you can see on the slide there, there's that threshold for respiratory depression. And even as the dose increases, in most people with Suboxone, you won't get above that threshold. And therefore, it's a much safer option than, than methadone and then other opiates. The outcomes for Suboxone compared to methadone are really very similar in terms of retention and treatment and ability to suppress illicit opiate use, um, as long as the, the Suboxone is dosed appropriately. So the range that seems to work is at least 12 milligrams. Um, and if it's at the lower dose, it doesn't seem to be quite as effective. Um, and again, like I said, it's a much safer medication than methadone in terms of overdose risk. It also has many fewer drug interactions than methadone does. This is a bit beyond the scope of this talk to talk about all the advantages and disadvantages of, of each option. All I want you to get out of this is that there's advantages and disadvantages to both. If one option doesn't work, we should try the other one. It's really important to note that both of them work and they're really effective in eliminating illicit opiate use. And for a lot of people, these medications are life-saving. So when they're on these medications, they're able to go to work, go to school, have relationships, um, and they aren't doing the things that maybe they don't want to be doing, like sex work or dealing or doing other things um, when they're on these medications. So they, they work really, really well. And yet, despite all this really good evidence to support the use of both methadone and Suboxone in the treatment of opiate addiction, there's huge stigma with these medications. And so the stigma relates mainly to the fact that the medications rather sit on the opiate receptor and stimulate the opiate receptor. And so a lot of people see these medications as just a substitute for heroin and you're still addicted to something. And you do have withdrawal when you come off these medications if you just stop them abruptly. So we taper people off of them. Um, so they, they are opiates, they act on the opiate receptor, but 
it gives people their lives back. So we don't, when we treat someone's opiate addiction with these medications, we don't see all the other behaviors. So people aren't injecting opiates. They're not, they're able to go to work, go to school, have relationships. And so the, the really, their, their lives are back um, when we can get them out of that cycle of constantly being in withdrawal, trying to get money to, to get their next fix. Many treatment centers and recovery houses have restrictions on the use of methadone and suboxone. Sometimes there are absolute bans, they absolutely won't take you. Sometimes there's restrictions on how long you can be on it and you have to taper off in a certain period of time. Sometimes there's restrictions on the dose that don't make a lot of, of kind of medical sense. So they'll say you can be on methadone but only at 30 milligrams. When the research really supports that most people need a dose between at least 60 to 100 milligrams for it to be effective. So there, there's still some work to be done in terms of improving um, acceptability of these medications and decreasing stigma. We'll talk a bit about harm reduction approaches in terms of engaging with people who maybe aren't ready to talk about treatment and some of these approaches apply to other substances not just opiates. Um, so one of the big ones is provision of harm reduction supplies so this is things like providing clean needles and sharp spins to dispose of these needles. Um, it's been clearly demonstrated that when we do this it decreases risk of HIV and Hep C because people aren't sharing needles. And when we don't do this, it can have really devastating results. This is a community in Indiana where these types of supplies were previously not readily available as it was thought that it would encourage drug use or promote drug use if you had uh, injection supplies available. So in a town of 4,000 people, there were 200 new cases of HIV, and this was largely related to um, shared needles for injection opiate use. So in terms of cost effectiveness, it's way, way, way cheaper to supply people with needles for injecting compared to treating HIV infections. It's really expensive to treat. Um, another harm reduction um, approach that you may have heard about in the media recently is something called take-home naloxone kits. And these are kits that are being distributed to people who use drugs, in particular opiates, but more and more we're looking at also providing them um, to people who use stimulants, as we know that increasingly there's fentanyl being mixed in stimulants as well, um, and also giving them to family members and friends of opiate users. And what these kits contain is an opiate reversal agent called naloxone. And so essentially if someone overdoses, you draw up this medication and you inject it into a big muscle, so like their arms, their thighs, or their bum, and it buys them some time. It's kind of like an EpiPen, so it's not definitive treatment for anaphylaxis, but it gives you a window of time to get that person to the emergency room for more definitive management. And that's kind of what Narcan or Naloxone is the other name for it does. It, it buys you a window of time to get that person further help. So we're quite actively giving out lots of these kits right now to opiate users um, because the, uh, the drug scene is so dangerous right now. And finally, a harm reduction approach called uh, supervised injection sites or supervised injection facilities. So this is a photo of the supervised injection site in Vancouver called Insight. And um, I thought I'd just go over what supervised injection sites are and then what they're not. Um, so supervised injection sites are a place where people can inject pre-obtained drugs in a supervised setting. There's harm reduction supplies available, so alcohol swabs, clean needles, syringes, cookers, um, sterile water, and then there's staff that work there um, that are trained to, to treat overdoses if they occur. The staff can also provide uh, clients with kind of education around safer injecting practices. So for example, they may help them find a vein that's more peripheral, like in their, in their hands, as opposed to going to like the, a vein in their neck, which we know is really dangerous. Um, also, they can connect people into addiction treatment. Um, what a supervised injection site is not. So it's not a place to purchase drugs, so you can't do drug deals at Insight. It's not a place where the government gives you drugs, so there's some 
some misperception sometimes about that. And it's not a place where other people can inject you. So you actually have to be able to inject your own drugs. Staff can inject you or another person there can't inject you with drugs. So there's been lots and lots of research um, coming out of Vancouver looking at Insight. And this is a kind of summary paper that was published a couple of years ago looking at a bunch of the research. And essentially what they showed was that Insight decreased rates of public injecting. So in the community around Insight resulted in reductions in syringe sharing, which we know is important for HIV and hepatitis C transmission, increases in safer injecting behaviors, and increased connection to addiction medicine treatment, and also resulted in in reductions in opiate overdoses in the area surrounding Insight. Additionally, they showed that there was no increase in initiation of injection drug use because that was a concern that the public had and it didn't seem to mean that more people would go on to inject drugs. Um, and there was no significant increase in drug-related crime. Coming down the pipeline is a new treatment um, that just got approved in May in the US called probufine. Buprenorphine is the active ingredient in the medication Suboxone. And so this is an implant that goes in your upper arm and it lasts for six months. And so this just came out in the States. I'm not sure how soon it may be available in Canada, but is a really interesting treatment option that's being kind of evaluated and, and just being looked at now. Um, in terms of preventing addiction, this is like I'm a family doctor, I'm all about prevention. The College of Physicians and Surgeons in BC recently came out with new guidelines and standards around how to kind of reverse this prescribing trend that we're in right now and how to help with these opiate overdoses. So these guidelines really are, are more so geared towards just prescribing for pain, how do we do what what is supported in the evidence or in the science. The guidelines really encourage family doctors to think twice about before you prescribe an opiate, make sure it's indicated for that condition. And then when you are prescribing, try and keep it at the lowest effective dose. Um, additionally, they really caution physicians to co-prescribe with other medications that we know are dangerous. So in, pers in particular, co-prescription of opiates with benzodiazepines, um, we know is a, is a potentially dangerous combination. So just a final review, addiction is a chronic brain disease that affects the reward pathways in our brain. It's treatable, we've got lots of science to support the way we treat it, and we need to start applying some of that science. And if one treatment option doesn't work, we should try others. We'll go back to this article that I showed you at the beginning, and what Dr. Bishop said was, as a definite clinical entity of physical disease, addiction is practically untaught in the school and unappreciated by the average medical man. The medical profession has, as a whole, ignored the subject as a clinical study or laboratory investigation. I would say the second part of that, we're, we're getting there in terms of the science, but we're still really not teaching it very well in medical school um, or residency. And so in terms of next steps, for improving addiction care. I think that's where there uh, should be a really big focus and we're working on this now. So improving um, addiction medicine integration into medical school and residency curriculums. There's a new addiction medicine fellowship program in Vancouver that's I think in its fourth year this year that trains um, family physicians also residents in internal medicine and psychiatry residents. And I think this year they have a public health resident and an emergency room uh, or eMERGE uh, resident. Last month, there was an announcement of a new organization called the BC Center for Substance Abuse, or Substance Use rather, and um, this is an organization that will be coming out with guidelines for, geared towards family physicians on how to increasingly screen for addiction and how to treat addiction and having um, concrete guidelines for family physicians. And then finally, just a kind of paradigm shift in terms of the way that we think about addiction. So it really is a chronic disease and we need to think about it as a chronic disease, um, not just these kind of acute interventions. And I think that's all that I have planned.